we'll just do some brief introductions. Um, let's let's start with you, Andy. Um, just a, just a brief introduction of yourself and the company, and then uh, everybody will know who everybody is. Andy. Andy Watson. I'm a partner and a fund manager at Europa Capital. I'm speaking to you from our office in Paris, just off the Champs Elysees. Um, Europa are a pan-European investment manager. I've been at that game for 20 odd years. We are 75% owned by a Japanese company, Mitsubishi Estates, with over 100 billion of assets. So we have a, a strong parent. In France, to situate us, uh, two buildings were sold last summer. One in Suren, an office building, uh, which was formerly Airbus, sold to an owner-occupier. And the other in Levallois, uh, also close to La Défense, uh, we sold the Dr. Lib full refurb. Uh, we have a core fund, we have a value add fund, and both have dry powder, which is waiting to invest in France. Perfect. Thanks very much, Andy. And we also have um, Reno Jezekiel, um, who's general manager for the Paris branch at Helleber. Um, Reno, just a brief introduction from you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, I'm the general manager for Helleber in Paris. So uh, I run a team of about 22 people with 11 dedicated to real estate finance. We have a book of 3 billion. Uh, we did about 1 billion euros of new business. And needless to say that this year is not going to be the same. I'm sure we're going to talk about that. Uh, recently, though, I mean, this year is getting a pretty good year. We have done about uh, 500 million euros of new business with flagship transactions, such as the financing of the uh, Altais Tower and uh, also the one also for Primonial. So uh, contrary to expectations, given COVID, uh, the outlook actually for the full year is quite good for, for Helaba in France and in general. Helaba, just by, uh, to give you a, some perspective, our, I mean, we are not listed, as everyone knows, but our shareholders equity is about 9 billion. And today, I'm sure everyone sees in the press that Sogen's market cap is 10, 10 billion. Natixis is uh, closer to 6 billion. So as you, everyone knows, the financial industry is under major, major uh, pressure. And uh, it's, indeed, it's a great challenge for us at Helaba as well. Um, Guillaume, um, let's, um, Guillaume Turkus, who I'm sure many of you know, but is managing partner for Faro Capital Partners. Um, but Guillaume, just, just a brief introduction from you, please. I'm just a small guy here running a, a small boutique and mainly focusing on the value add and opportunistic in uh, Paris, Greater Paris, for mostly two family offices, one uh, based out of the Middle East and uh, another one based in the US. So, you know, trying to unlock value mostly in office and residential. Super, that's great. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and Thomas? Thomas, I manage a capital market uh, department for Colis France, and we provide advice for landlords and, uh, and investors. And our team advise also investors on sale and acquisition for all, all kind of type of properties. Uh, about Colis in France, we are uh, three, 300 experts. We have uh, 10 offices in France from north and south. I mean, uh, Lille, Lille, Paris, Lyon, Marseille, and uh, we do all kinds of service uh, from, for corporate, but also for investors, for corporate as tenant representation, and for investors on uh, advice for brokerage and lending. That's super. Thanks very much. Um, and Laurence, no need to introduce Colliers because um, Thomas has done that very successfully. Um, but maybe just, just briefly on yourself and your remit. So I'm head of uh, research uh, of Colliers France. So I I follow all the the the, the market uh, for the the, the 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 business teams, uh, and we published a, a quarterly market report report on leasing and uh, investment market and thematic reports such as uh, Grand Paris uh, Express impact on the real estate market. Uh, we, we had a, a research plan on this subject uh, since uh, two years and we, we continue to, to work on this, uh, this uh, prospective uh, subject. That's super, thank you Laurence. Um, and um, obviously we've got a, a number of themes that we 
we're, we're going to discuss and pick up from the presentation. Um, but also, if you've got questions or comments, I, I can see that there are already comments coming into the uh, uh, into the comment and Q and A side. Um, please do add those in, and we'll make sure that we deal with those live as well and answer all of your questions. Um, Andy, I wanted to start with you, um, just because I think it was, you know, certainly a few months ago that we were on a panel together. Um, looking again at, at, at France, um, and I'm just interested to to pick up from you in terms of, I suppose, the influence of the health crisis on the French economy, the macro situation, um, and the changes that you've seen, and particularly as we're moving into the final quarter of 2020. Yeah, that was 10 months ago. Uh, was that it, was December 2019. You were kind enough to invite me along, and clearly the vibe was very, very different. Um, the two big preoccupations at that time were climate change and Brexit. Well, they were for Anglo-Saxons anyway. So these days, Brexit can't be found anywhere in the EU in the news, um, dominates in the UK. That's gone away. Um, but obviously, climate change is still out there and arguably accelerated. But the mood and the vibe has swung wildly along the way. So at the Pierre d'Or ceremony uh, at the end of January, which is an annual event for the French industry to award itself awards, the vibe was incredibly euphoric and optimistic. In my 26 years here living and working, I've never seen anything like it. It was as if all the stars were aligned for France, and clearly all of that suddenly went away as a mood of euphoria and around about one month ago at La Rentrée when people came back from holidays there was a certain tinge of optimism I thought that the tailspin that had been expected hadn't really come about the figures and Laurence mentioned some just now about the dip was going to be more nine percent than the eleven percent that INSEE had put out there and there were grounds for optimism, but of course it's a medical crisis first. And, you know, the numbers have got worse and progressively the screws have tightened. So it's a big swing in mood. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, and j just wondering about, um, I suppose, the, the broader picture. Um, Thomas, what, what are you seeing in terms of, uh, I suppose, the, the capital and the interest that's, that's looking at, at the market? A huge, huge demand for investing in real estate uh, with, uh, I would say, uh, same level of uh, demand as last year. Uh, the context is for owner. It was mainly during the COVID and, uh, and uh, till, till now a wait and see about uh, uh, disposal or uh, a changing or managing property. Um, so still, still huge the demand and uh, still huge the capital to be invested in, uh, in real estate. Uh, specifically, also there is uh, because my previous job was in the insurance company. Uh, what I see is a reallocation in real estate for the future for 2021. Uh, maybe one or two percent of the global picture of uh, invest investment uh, coming from insurance company. So it could be much more, I would say, capital in real estate in the future. Okay, good. And, and Renaud, uh, just in terms of the, the financing side, um, what have you been seeing as some of the key changes? How has it influenced, I suppose, your strategy, particularly looking at the French market? As far as I speak about our, ourselves first, uh, we are very much focused on core and core plus. We don't do uh, spec anymore. Uh, we don't uh, do value add or very value add and development financing. I think that's uh, as a senior lender, balance sheet lender, I think that will not come as a surprise. And I think that's also a very strong component to the equation of the investors and the, uh, the guys who want to sell uh, I think most of our direct competitors have done the same uh, for obvious uh, risk uh, reasons. 
Uh, having said, said that, uh, there have been a couple of very attractive value add transactions well located in Paris. Uh, I think Europa Capital knows, uh, at least uh, I know that all Europa Capital knows well about them. We have been approached by a, a number of uh, bidders there, but we, for the reasons I mentioned, uh, a strategic decision driven by risk appetite. We decided not to follow suit. However, uh, just uh, so that you understand, though, uh, on the 30th of uh, September, for Primonial, we financed this acquisition of uh, the one Monceau just uh, off town uh, um, uh, Avenue Hoche, uh, between Boulevard Courcel and uh, close to the Parc Monceau. It was a sale is back by ABN AMRO, where ABN has already announced that as part of their restructuring, that they are downsizing, moving out, etc. So they have a, a, a lease with some breaks. So we're actually financing a very attractive, well-located quality building uh, for Primonial, strong sponsor, with a strong spec component outwards. So I am on the fringes, though, of uh, doing very basic stuff, core stuff, which is very competitive and not very remunerative, but it, quite, it calms down my uh, risk people and trying to do uh, more value-add uh, or less, uh, uh, less uh, conservative uh, stuff. So... Uh, uh, I think going forward, you are going to see two things. A bunch of uh, traditional lenders who will just do core core plus. And you're going to see dead funds, mostly uh, looking into the value add opportunistic deals, uh, where then uh, until banks decide to ultimately go, go into that space as well. And that's going to bring, I think, value down mechanically, because that will not be there. Okay, that's interesting, um, particularly that, that around the, the, the debt funds. Um, Guillaume, what's, what's, your, what's your sense? I mean, you, you're obviously seeing um, capital coming, you know, from various different areas into France and vice versa. Um, what are you seeing in terms of the, the, the capital? Are you picking up the same ideas as, what, as Thomas is seeing? What, what, what's your sense of it? Well, maybe to kind of puzzle back, you know, uh, everyone has said is obviously, you know, I confirm, you know, what my uh, fellow uh, colleagues have been saying. And uh, yeah, obviously, you know, as uh, Laurence was mentioning, Paris is still, uh, I would say, uh, a must stop uh, within Europe. You know, it's basically one London, Germany, and then France is, uh, I would say, well, even greater Paris, even if greater Paris is not France. But basically, you have London, well, greater London, greater Paris, and the uh, top five, seven German cities that are, I would say, the must up when you kind of investing in Europe. But I would say, you know, mostly looking for, I would say, value add uh, properties. It's, uh, I think we're at a time where, and Renaud explained it really well, you know, financing is really hard to get. I would say senior financing, obviously you can go to uh, alternative lenders. And uh, when I say alternative, it's not, it's, it's not usually debt fund. It's more, I would say, hedge funds or, you know, uh, people that are, you know, really looking for high, uh, I would say high mid tens, uh, two digits in terms of uh, return when I want to, to go on a property. So I would say uh, value add investment um, is a little bit on hold uh, as basically the financing question is, uh, is really hard to answer as of now, even for the core plus segment, not only for the, for the value add. And in addition to that, uh, basically no one is really, you know, really knows where the rental levels are going, especially uh, in uh, suburban Paris. I would say Paris would be stable, hopefully. And uh, and the last but not least is that the expectations of the sellers are obviously not the expectation of the buyers. So when you try to position yourself on a suburban value add deals, uh, you struggle just to talk and, you know, to get a bank on a line, then it's really hard to model yourself uh, within two, three years uh, as per rental level. And uh, obviously you come to the seller with a pricing that is, I would say, at least 20 to 30% down to his last uh, you know, valuation, his last kind of book value, whatever he has uh, in his records. So I would say there's still a huge mismatch between sellers and buyers. And I would say so the, the, the last thing that, is, that has never been really witnessed in France is for the last 10 years, mostly as CPIs, so the retail funds, such as Primonel, you know, and all those people like this, have been amassing, collecting a lot of assets. And those guys as of now are not, you know, straight sellers. So I would say, you know, the market is not um, coming back with a lot of products. So few products, mismatch between the pricing, 
uh, banks are, I would say, still a little bit shy, especially when it comes to suburban Paris. So I would say there's, you know, a lot of uh, parts that are missing in the equation to be solved to get a, a proper model uh, running on. So, you know, I think we need time to adapt all of that. Okay, good. Um, and feel free, anybody also to, we're all being incredibly polite, but feel free to, to come in on any, on any views that, that you've got. Um, Thomas, are you, are you seeing that as well, just in terms of that, that, that point around, um, I suppose, the, the difference between the expectations of buyers and sellers at the moment? I am here, but uh, some uh, I would real estate firm um, forecast by uh, minus 20% of value. Um, what, what we have seen since the, the beginning of the year is a repricing of minus 10, something like that. Um, above minus 10, uh, I have not seen anything right now. What we, can, uh, what we can see, there was one big transaction, uh, Laurence mentioned, with the building of Nestlé, uh, owned by uh, Unibuy, the ship building. Uh, finally, the pricing was uh, not really a reprice. Uh, we work on this, on this uh, file, with, on this building, and finally, uh, only Unibuy knows and the buyer knows. But uh, what we see is there was not a minus, uh, I would say, a minus 15 or 20 percent to pricing. So for the moment, uh, to be factual, it's between minus five, minus 10 percent. It's important to differentiate between yeah. product types. So it's not a blanket minus 10. Um, in fact, on the value add side, where finance is either hard to get or non-existent, expensive, uh, then I'd say that it's more in the 20% range that the repricing. And yet, those sort of deals haven't been done. It's just bids in. On the other hand, for Central Paris Core, where rents are holding up, I don't see much change in pricing. But it's it's the you know, there's an old property saying that you know, property floats on a sea of debt. So where that debt, where the tide goes out, then I think the repricing really comes in. I would even emphasize and say that for core products that checks all the boxes. So you know, a technical uh, modern building, uh, beautiful tenant, long term, you you would even get a better value than the, the one you could have you know gotten like a couple of months ago. So. For core, you know, everyone is chasing core. There's you know, not a lot of products available, so you can get better value than you could have like a couple months ago. But on the other end, for value add, it's uh, you know, good luck to challenge. I would say the seller's uh, expectations. Uh, Renault, I think you wanted to pick that up as well. No, I I, I fully agree with what Andy says, as well as uh, all the others. Uh, clearly, differentiating between assets and location is is key, and quality of tenants. Uh, and like Andy says, I mean, yeah, the tide is coming out. So that's where I think borrowers and investors uh, really uh, need to think about the banking relationships as well. And the bankers uh, focus on their core clients. Uh, focus is really, uh, that's really in these times, we have been through that already 12 years ago and before. That's really when you know where your real friends are. So Richard, I was on a panel uh, last week with four Germans rather than four French people. And uh, we talked about tides. And one of the presenters there uh, adapted to the Warren Buffett quote about when the tide goes out, you see who's wearing swimming trunks. So he, his adaptation was that right now the governments are holding the water in, uh, in the sense that in France, it's chômage partiel. In Germany, it's Kurzarbeit. The whole economy for the minute is being protected by government funds. And it's only when that goes away that you see what's happening next. I think that's one to bear in mind. Okay, so we... we <laughs> yeah, so that paints quite a, quite a picture, Andy. <laughs> it's a mental um, image for a Thursday morning, isn't it? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, that's yeah. that's an interesting point. I mean, let's 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 explore that a little bit more. Actually, unpack that a bit because um, obviously we've got um, you you can't have this amount of 
um, you know, lack of economic activity without that having some kind of effect in terms of a recession going forward. Um, how do we see particularly, I mean, obviously there have been different um, government actions within the UK, within Germany, within France. Um, what are we seeing as the potential impact of that uh, in terms of the recessionary side and the impact on real estate? And also, um, I, I suppose, the impact of, of the current government um, position within within France, because that may be something that's very familiar in the French market, but less familiar outside. So when property, we hear this a lot, has gone in to this crisis with a couple of comfort blankets. One of them is low vacancy rates. We hear that, you know, oh, be all right, central Paris, 2%, no problems. Uh, and then the other one is cheap money. So all of that I do believe in, but there's another property saying about um, rental pricing, which is, yes, it's a function of supply and demand, but actually it's two-thirds demand and one-third supply. So right now, Laurence has shown us we have a lot less demand uh, in, in the market, and La Défense is kind of the epicenter of that for the minute. But uh, clearly, next year, uh, there'll be pressure a downwards pressure on the market. Okay, good. Um, I wanted to pick up a, a little bit on the on the sectors. Um, just just in terms of, of of what you're seeing in the markets. Um, maybe just pick up with you first, Renault, and then then I want I want to explore that a little bit more with you, Laurence, as well. Renault, in, in terms of the in terms of the sectors. Um, I suppose, how are you seeing those in terms of financing? Um, because obviously there's different views about uh, the future of office, um, what's going to happen with hospitality, leisure, um, those kinds of things. So how are you seeing the sectors? I think, uh, I think that basically people are focusing on, on quality and resilience. So uh, any strategic real estate will always find uh, financing from anyone even value-add stuff, like all this stuff which BNP Paribas is selling around the OPR area. I mean, they, the, the buyers there are doing great deals and they are getting financing. Uh, I think the alternative classes, uh, as we used to call them, uh, like hospitality, uh, retirement houses, uh, I mean, these are going to be for the specialist lenders. I think we are, the, those, like ourselves, in fact, we are contemplating moving into that. We, we are not going to do that and we are so glad we didn't. Uh, I'm sad for the sector because I actually love it, but uh, love the sector. <laughs> but uh, I'm glad I'm, I'm not in it right now. Just look at what Accor Invest, the troubles of Accor Invest, the property business of Accor, which was announced uh, yesterday. So um, the, 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 the main market for commercial real estate anyway is office. Office is there to stay. Uh, it's going to be uh, paramount to the growth of anyone. Uh, second is, I think, is going to still, uh, well, it's going to be a nice balance mix between uh, retail, which has its own challenges, and logistics, which uh, no need to, to explain that. Uh, that. That's very strategic. And we are seeing an increased uh, interest in Resi, especially Resi in Paris, uh, very different dynamics from any other main, uh, the main city in the world, uh, you know, it's France. Uh, but... Um, uh, in fact, ourselves, we, we, we want to increase our exposure to it. Out of the three billions of loans we have, only 1% in, is in uh, Resi. And in fact, in, we're in the process of closing a, a very good transaction uh, next month with a strong uh, U.S. pension fund who has identified that pocket as a, as a gross area. And that ties in, uh, not that I have privy conversation with uh, 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 Mer um, the CEO of Jessina, uh, but uh, they announced yesterday that uh, despite what they were saying three years ago, now they have identified Resi alongside Nexity as a key uh, area for, for growth. So uh, to sum up, office, still big focus. Uh, logistics, I would put second, but uh, we have been ourselves at Elaba doing that for more than four years. Uh, still retail, which is, it needs to be uh, redefining itself, and, uh, and Resi more so. I mean, um, I, I, well, I'm, we are in the middle of strategic discussions within Helaba, but I'd love to increase my exposure in Paris to 10% of, uh, uh, of my book to Resi. In Germany, we already do that quite a lot. And alternative, alternative assets, 
like I said, I leave that to the specialist guys. Okay, good. Um, Laurence, I just wanted to pick up with you. Um, a, I suppose your view on the on the sectors, what you're seeing from the research side, um, and also look a little bit more at those. Uh, you know, are we seeing a growth in terms of things like data centers, life sciences? Um, the, the the residential everything from kind of student housing up to senior living in healthcare. Um, what's the situation? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, I'm I'm uh, agree with uh, with Reno and uh, with the data we we see uh, we note uh, a growth in in Resi. Uh, it's uh, it's sure, and we see a lot. More a lot of transaction on this uh, market segment, uh, and with a lot of diversity in uh, in uh, the Resi uh, market, such as uh, student uh, student uh, residence, um, but also uh, a growth in uh, senior housing and care assets. Uh, it's particularly strong uh, in the data seen around uh, two, two, two years, uh, around two years. Um, for data center, it's difficult to see with the data uh, on the data, but we see a lot of investors who uh, want to explore this, uh, this type of assets. Uh, I know that in uh, in the UK, uh, my colleague uh, told me that there, there are a lot more and more uh, transaction on this on uh, this market, and we have discussion uh, with uh, investors and promoters who are exploring in France this uh, this type of assets. But it's not strong on the data for the moment. But I think it will be. Uh, uh, a trend uh, in the in the next uh, next years. Okay, good. Um, I wanted to pick up your view as well, Andy, on this. I mean, obviously, um, there may well be a difference between the domestic capital um, in France and also the international capital. But what's your, I suppose, if, if you pick up that view in terms of those, but also what's your sense looking at the, I suppose, the main um, sectors? As to the domestic versus international, quite clearly, um, the physical constraints of internationals not being able to go touch, see, and opine on investment committees means that domestics are winning the day. And that's true in other countries as it's in France. Um, last year, the La Défense market was underpinned by Korean capital, and they're not coming. They can't come. My parent company, Mitsubishi, uh, we run separate accounts with them. Um, they're a little bit on hold for the minute, unless they're in countries where Mitsubishi have people on the ground. So, I mean, all of that is a very real constraint for the minute. Happily, fund model goes on, and we're about to take into my core fund a Japanese third-party investor, um, and they can put their money away through the fund model. So, in this crisis, unlike the last, Perhaps the fund model might get the upper hand over separate accounts. Um, I believe you also asked the question there about sectors. I mean, I think it suffice to say that there's a quite astonishing polarization six months in. So on the one end, the beds and the sheds. So residential and logistics. On the other end, the retail and hospitality. But what that really means, and we hear it on every one of these webinars and market stories, what that really means is that all that wall of capital is aimed now funneling in to beds and sheds first. Now, in Paris, offices are the backbone of the market and will go on being so, but we have an extraordinary polarization in sectors. Okay, that's interesting. I'll drill down a little bit more because I... Um coming up on some of those Andy because I know that, that also retail is one of the areas that you've focused on for a long time in in kind of mm. previous positions um, but Thomas I, I just wanted to come come to you also just picking up a little bit on um, the office sector a lot of discussion around work from home and those kinds of things and certainly um, when I'm listening to 
you know, kind of the discussion in the UK, there's a lot of talk then about um, maybe there being more opportunities for, um, I guess, the smaller cities um, outside of the core business districts and suburban areas um, to maybe have, you know, to have a, a new life in a way because people may only be spending two days a week in their main office. Um, is that something that's also, a, a, I suppose, a discussion in France or is it still it's Paris and Greater Paris and that's really mainly it? There, there is uh, those discussion uh, at corporate level for big companies or something like that. But um, we are at the beginning of this uh, strategy for corporate. What, what we see about corporate and uh, what our uh, tenant representation department uh, does is only, uh, I would say, uh, strategy to downsize the layout. So for the moment, uh, corporate uh, want uh, to forecast less footprint in office in the future. So this is the first step I, right now. And maybe the second step, maybe to uh, say outsource out, out of Paris some uh, loca office location. So this is, the, I'm really factual, this is what we do uh, for corporate is reduction of layout, downside of layout, or strategy to downside the layout for the future. So, but this will release also some uh, space because it will be everywhere. I, uh, we imagine that not only in Paris, but everywhere in France. So this could release also some uh, office space downtown Paris or uh, also down downtown smaller uh, cities in France. So this is, this is, I'm really factual on this. For the moment, um, to have satellites like uh, in, in uh, cities, uh, say regional cities, it's a project, but we have not, we have not seen any uh, real project for the moment. Okay, and, and just in general, this is for anybody really is, I mean, lots of good information from Laurence there about Grand Paris. We've obviously discussed that and the, and the Olympics. Um, does any of what's happened in the last kind of um, seven, eight months change that? Uh, does it accelerate it? Um, what, what, what's anybody's view on that? Yeah, I think, you know, the Grand Paris project is, uh, is a master scheme. So honestly nothing we really, really i would say impact this scheme unless well we will obviously bear more delays and you know it's it's friends so you obviously have delays so it's a real date does is not a real date but uh, i would say this will allow as it was uh, well described on the, on the on the map that was shown uh, previously that you know paris will be connecting from any point i mean you know as of now if you want to go from basically if you're on the eastern suburban part of paris you want to join i would say the north part well you gotta back you gotta go back to central paris and then you know change maybe commute like two twice or something but you know in, in the next i would say you know let's be optimistic five to seven years you know you can circle around paris easily so i think it will change the way people obviously will circulate and uh, will meet and obviously, you know, uh, people looking for some space or for some, you know, uh, office or resi or whatever, uh, will have a totally different kind of mapping. So, I mean, as of now, everything is kind of, you know, going back to the center and then, you know, getting out of it. And I think in the next, yeah, you know, let's say for three to five years, uh, the big companies are going to, I would say, uh, reinterpret the way they're thinking real estate, not just, uh, I would say, a balance between East and West, like a, uh, huge you know domestic firms are doing as of now but more something completely different and obviously you know as it was mentioned the work from home thing which was i would say not really um something that a lot of people were doing here because you know we're latin people so we're not so disciplined as you guys back in the uk or in germany so we need to um, to have the staff close to the office when we, you know, we just need to know what those guys were, are doing so this is totally you know unfortunately due to the virus you know Things have been changing, and a lot of companies are now witnessing that. I mean, for certain part of the staff, certain category of people, obviously, uh, you know, remote working is something that works not all the time, not all the week, but you know, that is a plus. So, I would imagine there will be some kind of reshifting and rebalance all around Paris of resi office in relation to um, you know all what has been said, and maybe j j just the last thing because you know the 
the kind of virus thing that, you know, occults, I would say, the dynamism that was in France and in Europe. I just wanted to take a step back because, uh, and, you know, nothing against my American friends, but if, you know, any one of you has, uh, has been talking to some people that are working in New York, in Manhattan, especially, or in, in LA, you know, especially in New York and Manhattan, no one has been going back to the, to the office. I mean, it's, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, videos or pictures from the streets. It's, it's horrible, you know, like Times Square is kind of empty. And, uh, you know, so obviously the situation could be way better. And, you know, we just want to see something, some perspective, just to put some proper numbers in our model. And you know, we don't want to, um, to have some mud uh, I would say, way of thinking. But if you look, I would say, on the other side of the Atlantic, notably, uh, where, you know, a lot of, uh, I would say, mastermind comes from, I would say the situation is really creepy from, uh, I would say, living and also perspective. So let's not so, be... So you, you know, mentioned, to, to uh, Guillaume, you mentioned Amazon. Um, this is a tremendous soundbite from another panel I was on about retail, which Richard mentioned. I run the ULA Retail Council. So we had Scott Malkin uh, as a speaker, you know, the very excellent Scott. And he said, uh, apropos of Amazon, he said, so in the States, we're, we're saying, look, guys, the war is over. Bricks and mortar lost. Amazon won. <laughs> and you know, it, it was a great way of saying, heck, retail has taken a lot of blows. And here I'm talking about France and specifically Paris. COVID is an accelerator of things that were already in there. So the idea that retail was struggling was already apparent in 2016, 17, and then three separate blows, you know, the trifecta. We had Gilets jaunes, riots in 2018. We had a general strike in 2019, and now 2020, we've had the plague. So retail has really taken it. And you know, my heart goes out to all the traders. Uh, it'll come back. Huh? There's going to be real returns in retail to be had in two, three years when it's stabilized. It has its role to play. But uh, the Amazon thing that Guillaume references has um, been quite extreme, hasn't it? I'm sure we've all been shopping for things in the last six months and had Amazon packages at the door. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and Andy, just, just quickly on that, because I know we're, we're coming close to the end of our time in some ways, and there's a couple of things I just wanted to pick up. But um, how do you see the discussion around leisure and hotels? Because obviously, um, France, Paris, huge tourist destination. Yeah, I mean, 90 million tourist visits. It's the, lead, the world's leading tourist destination, full stop. Head of Spain, head of anywhere. Um, I, th I see that coming back, absolutely. But probably not till there's a reliable vaccine delivered, widely available. Okay, good. Um, I just wanted to pick up quickly on the on the point that came up earlier um, and has been a, a big part of the discussion, which is um, ESG, wellness. Um, how much of an influence is that having um, at the moment on the market? Are there real kind of concrete, um, I suppose, influences that you're expecting to see from, from the acceleration of that trend? I, I know, Renault, for example, that on the financing side, there's quite a lot of initiatives. Yes, indeed. And I think it's uh, very strategic and uh, it's a value, uh, value component. So uh, lenders are increasingly starting to look at it. Uh, corporate bonds have been, uh, I mean, there have been green bond issues. And in the UK, Helaba has actually been putting in place uh, some green qualified uh, financing. Are still waiting to do the same uh, replicate in uh, in France, but uh, indeed uh, ESG uh, related matters, it's a, it's a value value factor, and in these days it's extremely important. I mean, if we have time, um, and I, we may not, but uh, uh, on on the Grand Paris Olympic stuff, I would like to highlight that we are very lucky to have this project, by the way, and I have a lot of respect for all the builders uh, and uh, not only the companies, but the actually the guys who are building all this stuff on the chantier because uh, working with a mask uh, and with the current uh, environment, this is, I mean, claims respect from anyone. Uh, we are seeing delays in uh, projects, obviously, which are being delivered, and that's going to have an impact uh, on values, on financing, on the lenders, on the investors. Another point, I think, to reflect on 
is uh, or two are relative in relation to what Thomas was saying. Uh, I'm quite surprised by what he's saying that the, the, the I know that the corporates are waiting, are reflecting as to what their real estate strategy should be. I would have thought, uh, but I'm not in these circles, I would have thought that they actually would be looking at increasing space selectively because of the distancing, uh, which uh, you need to uh, comply with if you want to have your, your employees back. Meanwhile, uh, I mean, there are different strategies as well. You may try to have rotating teams, which then command less, less space. Anyways, we have seen that uh, there has been a huge spike in terms of the ratio of uh, supply to um, uh, take up. And that's going to be to stay for a while, especially given what uh, Laurence, Laurence figures uh, showed. So that's going to be a major, major challenge for everyone uh, willing, to, uh, willing to play in, in this space. And the final thing I would like to pick up mostly on the Andes point relative to the Asians. We have seen Koreans buying a lot of stuff over the past four to five years. And as we know, they tend to borrow over a five-year term. What will happen uh, soon, they will have to repay. And uh, we are going to have interesting conversations with them, whether the sponsors, the, the investors, the, the tenants, and the lenders, obviously. So there are quite a number of topics to, uh, to address, uh, at least in the Paris market, or the okay. Paris market. Great. Thanks, Rena. Um, and just quickly, Andy, because in, in, I, I think that within the government um, scheme, there's also quite a focus on, on ESG, Andy. Is that right? Absolutely. Um, the 100 billion that Laurence referenced, the plan de relance, uh, I think at least 20 of that is earmarked for greening up real estate. And that's something that we're all acutely aware of. And that's a very good thing. That's the last, the last thought then, because I know we're very young short uh, on the COVID situation, is about structural change. And the idea that Generally speaking, people tend to overestimate its impact in the short term and underestimate in the long term. So that was my thought for the day. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. And just very quickly, um, in, in terms of the um, locations, do you think it, it has increased the focus on, um, I suppose, the more regional cities, um, or, or, or is it still, is is that still less of a focus? I mean, I'm just thinking because there's more domestic capital than international capital, that maybe we would expect to see um, regional cities take more of a, you know, more of a share of the pie for the for the for the next six months or so. Same as uh, last year, uh, we. We managing some deals and some closing in uh, regional city at the I would say the same price uh, as last year, but not really I would say a strong demand for uh, regional city, uh, except the Lille, Paris, and New. The rest is out of scope for uh, eighty percent of investors. Okay, interesting. <laughs> I would say in terms of uh, investment volume, uh, regional city the, uh, the decrease less uh, this year than Paris region. And the, the first one in terms of investment volume is Lyon and followed by, uh, by Lille this, uh, this year. Okay, good. Um, just, as a, just as a final round for, for, for everybody, looking particularly at the investment focus um, and investing in the in the French market um, where do we think the opportunities are at the moment and you can decide whether those are short term medium term longer term um, but but where do we think those are at the moment um, let's 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 start with you um, Guillaume just in terms of where you're seeing the potential opportunities at the moment in the French market well I'm currently uh, deeply investigating obviously uh, the hotel sector, as mentioned, uh, well, they faced the, the terrible last, uh, I would say, six months. And I don't think, you know, when, when you just switch on the news, I don't think the next uh, three, four, maybe quarters are, are going to help them. So, uh, it's, you know, there's going to be a situation where I think there, there will be potentially attractive pricing. And obviously, uh, something that is really coming back, especially in suburban, I would say, diffuse or, you know, not so well located office building, it's the reconversion in Resi. You know, you, there's, uh, I think, a lot of uh, office uh, 
uh, space that is, I would say, far from uh, public transportation, you know, that, that was currently uh, facing, I would say, you know, losing, I would say, expectations. And as of now, with, you know, all uh, that we have been saying, I don't really think any tenants are going to go over there. And, you know, uh, resi pricing over there, I would say close to Bourbon, obviously, not, you know, 20 or 30 kilometers from, from the Paris ring, obviously. But you still have strong resi prices in a range from 10 to 12,000 euro per square meter. So I think it's, it's, it will be a, a thing to really dig into. Yeah. Okay, super. Um, Laurence, what, what's, the, what's the research telling you? Where, where are the opportunities, do you think? And we'll see if you agree with Thomas. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I, I would say uh, again, senior house and care assets uh, due to the the, the hedging of the population. Uh, I think it will be uh, will have a big part of the the need for this type of uh, assets uh, in a residential uh, segment uh, we see the growth of co-living uh, and uh, some first transaction investment transaction in this market uh, like uh, when uh, on the example of uh, core assets transaction i uh, note the um, toco uh, it was a mix uh, between uh, offices and uh, co a new co-living operation uh, built by uh, La Française. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, prospective too, I would say uh, a big uh, subject on, uh, top, uh, on the um, brownfield, the reconvention on brownfield, uh, industrial and uh, retail brownfield. And I know that uh, some developers are uh, look, uh, looking at this, uh, this type of uh, opportunities. Okay, great. Um, Renaud, what's, what's your sense? Uh, as a German balance sheet uh, lender, no surprise that my focus would be Coco plus office first, Resi uh, logistics, logistics portfolio second, Resi third, and uh, retail. Uh, as a kind of a, with a grander vision longer term, uh, given the, that I think te technology connectivity uh, will accelerate and the flexibility of also approach to work style will, will evolve. Uh, I would uh, try to position myself on this vision uh, where in fact they are talking about it in Paris or so setting up this village crystals where you'll have like uh, you're rebuilding a little bit of villages within inside Paris with a mix of everything, mixed use, uh, as I think you, you, you quoted uh, earlier. Yes, I mean, a lot of that mixed use has been a huge part of the discussions that, that we've been having, Renault. Um, Thomas, what's your view? I am convinced of the rebound of uh, La Défense uh, offices. There was, uh, I would say, La Défense office bashing, but it's uh, an opportunity for the, for the next decade because we are going to find the uh, treatment for the virus. So this will become, I would say, a new office center and a new hub uh, in, in France. So this is my bet for the future. Okay, I, <laughs> I like the term La Défense bashing. Uh, that's a new one on me. <laughs> Good. Um, and last but not least, Andy. I think short term, the answer is beds and sheds. Um, that's our strategy, Europa's strategy for getting the dry powder out, both for core and for value add. That comes with a but, and the but is pricing. So we, we're there to sniff out the best risk adjusted returns. And the way that the capital is all funneling into those two sectors will make it hard. Uh, in the medium term, I absolutely believe in retail and hospitality. And the medium term, if this funnel thing goes on, could come rather faster than we think. So, uh, but it all stands or falls, as Thomas says, with finding the answer to the medical crisis. And from there, I'm optimistic for a strong rebound. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for, for joining us. Um, and thank you very much to, to the speakers. Thank you for sharing your views um, and look forward to joining you at the next one. Thanks very much. Bye bye.